and get started. Um, there's a sign-in sheet going around. Please uh, just sign your name. It just helps us with the pizza, so we appreciate it if you could just put your name on it. Uh, I do see some new faces, so welcome. This is the Tools and Technology Seminar Series. It's a weekly seminar. happens this time every week. Um, just to discuss tools, technologies, methodologies that um, are of interest and relevant to the attendees and the biomedical community. So today I'm pleased to present our speaker, um, Adam Deal. He is a computer research specialist in Alan Boyle's lab in the Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics. Um, thank you for that intro. Um, I'm Adam Deal, again, a research uh, computer specialist in Alan Boyle's lab. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the Human Mouse Sys Regulatory Module Browser, uh, which is a tool that I developed to uh, analyze and interpret the data related to my primary project, which is looking at gene regulatory grammar and how that's evolved between human and mouse. So to give you an overview of what, uh, what I'll discuss today, I'll start by giving you an introduction to grammar and how gene regulation can be thought of as a language. Oh, hope I don't hit that button too much. Um, I'll talk to you about two different ways of studying regulatory evolution. So positional conservation, which is entirely sequence-based, and grammatical conservation, which is more language-based. And then I'll talk about how we've uh, simplified gene regulatory language by using a machine learning method um, to combine sets of regulatory instructions that have equivalent meanings into what we call grammatical patterns. Um, I'll talk about some of the challenges that we've encountered as, we, as we've tried to look at the functional uh, properties of these grammatical patterns. And then I'll discuss with you the Human Mouse Sys Regulatory Module Browser that I developed as a tool to address some of these challenges. So starting with a um, brief uh, introduction to the underlying technology before I talk about the three main functions uh, in the module browser, the module browser itself, the compare maps utility, and the extensible search function. Um, and there will be some demonstrations involved in that. And I'll close with a brief summary and discussion of the future directions for this uh, browser. So before I move on to my first slide, I do want to uh, bring up this quote uh, from a, uh, this is from a like, what, a talk that was AMA. given, and a Reddit AMA that was done just, uh, what, just in the last couple of days, right? So. Today. Oh, hey, well, there you go. Um, so this is a quote from Elise Feingold, who is an NIH program director for ENCODE. And it says, the Human Genome Project mapped the letters of the human genome, but it didn't tell us anything about the grammar. Where the punctuation is, where the starts and ends are, that's what ENCODE is trying to do. So I thought this was very timely and a very good uh, way to give some context to this project and this uh, browser. So. So first off, what is grammar? So the dictionary definition is here. Grammar is simply a set of structural rules for the composition of clauses, phrases, and words in any given natural language, right? So to illustrate this, so uh, <clears throat> we've all seen one of these before. This is a dictionary. It's just a collection of words, each of which has its own intrinsic meaning. But if we want to take these words and combine them to create more complex uh, statements and phrases and sentences, we need a set of rules for how to combine those things, or else we'll just end up with a bunch of uh, nonsense. So those rules are uh, called grammars. And there are many different grammars. And when we combine uh, these uh, uh, words with an appropriate grammar, we're able to put together uh, an infinite variety of different statements and sentences, enough to fill books and libraries um, you know, beyond imagination. So put simply, though, a grammar is a set of rules for combining words to form meaningful statements. So inherent to this uh, concept is the idea of modularity. And there's modularity at two levels. And the easiest way to uh, illustrate this is through an example. So if I give you two sets of words here, and a simple set of grammatical rules for how we can combine these words. Even given a very simple sentence, we can create a, uh, uh, a fairly broad array of uh, meaningful statements. So to give you one example that will be very familiar to any of you in the room who have done any programming, um, the software crashed and the programmers lamented. Now related to this first level of modularity, the first mod level of modularity is at the word level. So by swapping out some of these words, I can dramatically change the meaning of this sentence to something very different and much sadder. So word level modularity means that small changes in word, word usage can dramatically affect the meaning of the sentence. 
The second level of modularity is at the sentence level, where this sentence or the previous sentence means the same thing regardless of when, where, and uh, by whom it's spoken. So it doesn't matter where I stand in the room or if I go to a different room or have somebody else say it, it means the same thing. So how do we extend this concept to gene regulation? Well, we start with a set of transcription factors that are analogous to words in the dictionary, and each of these has its own intrinsic meaning and value as, pertains, uh, as pertaining to its uh, target gene expression level. And we can combine these into more complex regulatory instructions by following a regulatory grammar. So I've given you a regulatory grammar here that consists of three fairly simple rules that are actually based on things that we know to be true about gene regulation in the real world. And when we combine these, we can come up with a pretty broad array of regulatory uh, sentences. So I'll go through a few examples, the most simple of which is just to take an express tag and put it upstream of a target gene, which gets us two units of expression. We can build on that by adding a suppressed tag, which completely blocks expression, a more tag, which gains us an additional unit of expression, a less tag, which takes away one unit of expression, or we can do some more complex things, like add both a more and a less tag, which simply returns us to basal expression. So relating this back to the previous example, small changes in transcription factor word content can dramatically affect the meaning of the uh, regulatory instruction and the expression of the target gene. And furthermore, these regulatory sentences mean the same thing, regardless of when, where, and in which cell type they're used. And to build on this a little bit further, you'll notice here that different regulatory sentences can have equivalent meanings. So for example, genes 1 and 5. So there's a level of redundancy that's built into this code. And this turns out to be a very useful property that I'm going to come back to. So shifting gears a little bit, I want to tell you about two different, two different approaches to study regulatory evolution. <clears throat> the first of these uh, we call positional conservation. It's based on the sort of traditional level or traditional understanding of conservation that most of you will be familiar with, where uh, conservation of function is inferred based on sharing of sequences between multiple species. So in this figure I've shown, these gray <laughs> bars represent chromosomes in five different species, and the black and white bars superimposed on them represent regulatory uh, sequences that have been mapped to each of these species. And you'll notice that some of these are unique to one species, whereas others are shared between multiple species, meaning that there is some form of regulatory sentence that occupies that piece of sequence in all of these species. And the underlying assumption based on positional conservation is that these are all serving the same regulatory function and thus having equivalent effects on the expression of the target gene. Unfortunately, several studies have tried to use this mode of conservation, and in many cases, this is not actually the case. And this primarily stems from the fact that transcription factor binding is known to evolve very rapidly between species, so individual transcription factor binding sites are created and destroyed um, over evolutionary time with the net effect that just because there is a regulatory sequence in the same you know, orthologous location in multiple species, it's being used for some regulatory purpose, but the specific regulatory purpose that that is serving often changes. So there's different regulatory sentences in, in each of these species potentially, even though they are all serving a regulatory function. So we have proposed a uh, alternative to, to positional conservation, which we call grammatical conservation, which instead of looking at uh, the sequence level, at shared sequences, we're looking at the language, more the gene regulatory language level, and defining conservation as sharing of regulatory sentences between species, no matter where they live in the genome. And we're uh, making the assumption here that uh, conserved regulatory sentences serve, serve the same function in all species and in all genomic locations. So uh, to give you an example, here we have two different, two different um, regulatory sentences represented uh, upstream of some human and some mouse genes. And you'll see that it, they are um, eliciting the same function in uh, all contexts in both, both of these species. And so we believe that we can gain significant insight into regulatory evolution and function by comparing these sets of regulatory sentences and how they're used in different species. 
Uh, but there's a problem. So there are over uh, roughly around 1,700 transcription factors predicted in mammals. And so it would be intractable to investigate the regulatory properties of all of them. But if you remember uh, what I mentioned on the previous slide about this level of redundancy that's built into the regulatory code, we can make use of that here and simplify the regulatory landscape by making use of machine learning methods to simplify this search space into sets of equivalent regulatory sentences. And we've done exactly that. So starting with ChIP-seq data sets for 27 transcription factors and four human and mouse immune cell types, we first assembled cis regulatory modules based on mutual overlap of chip seq peaks in uh, sequences from these four different cell types. And we were left with a little under 210,000 individual cis regulatory modules that spanned around 81,000 distinct loci. So we took those data and we fed them into a self organizing map algorithm, which we used to infer functional similarity among those elements. And our underlying hypotheses were that this functional similarity derives from similarity in the transcription factor content of these modules, and that the regulatory patterns that we find retain the same function in all species, cells, and genomic context in which we find them. And we were left with 780 grammatical patterns, which are represented as individual locations on this graphical map here, and each of which can be thought of as a set of regulatory sentences with equivalent meanings. So once we had those, we wanted to know something about what they were doing and look at their functional annotations, both as a way to follow up on these hypotheses to see if they do indeed show evidence of shared functions, and also just on a general level to probe functions and see what we can find out about uh, regulatory evolution and function from this. So we looked at a bunch of different things. And I'm not going to go through these one by one, but I just want to point out here that there's a lot of stuff on this slide. And we quick, quickly ran into this situation, which will be familiar to most of you in the room, where the more types of annotations we added, the more difficult a time we had coming up with a coherent story of what's going on. So we needed a way to put all the data in context and make them user friendly so we could actually make some real insights. So lucky for us, part of the work had already been done in that the package that we, uh, that we used to do the self-organizing map already has built into it a way to take annotations and map them back to this graphical SOM grid. So this can be anything from a categorical label that's intrinsic to the uh, patterns themselves or other more continuous properties intrinsic to the patterns, such as the number of transcription factors that make up that pattern. Or it can be other external data that we map to the uh, cis regulatory modules and then in turn map back to the self-organizing map grid, such as is shown here with the uh, median log 2 distance to the nearest transcription start site. There I go again. So these are a convenient way to view and compare patterns overall properties. <coughs> but there are some drawbacks here. So first of all, each one of these has to be hand created in R. So you have to read in the data, produce the map, and then potentially do other things to it afterward, like resizing and scaling and whatnot, to make the thing, uh, you know, look the, you know, show what you want it to. And this gets quite time consuming. Once you've produced those, then it's a static image that you can't really do very much with, except for look at it and say, hey, that's great. But every time you want to add something or change something, you have to go back to square one and produce a whole new image. Once you've done this many times, you get a lot of different image files. And it's cumbersome to work with them and really tease out any, any um, you know, correlations with them. And finally, these things inherently can only show summary statistics related to the patterns, not module level properties. So looking at a plot like this, we can see that, say, that pattern right there is composed of modules that are close to transcription start sites. But it doesn't tell us anything about what those target genes are, or what they're doing, or if the modules are marked as promoters, for instance, based on their histone modification profiles, or anything like that, right? So generally, these maps raise more questions than answers. So we wanted to develop a framework that would help us probe these questions. And so I developed the, uh, and in, in doing so, I faced several challenges. The first of which is just keeping dra track of what data are available. So thinking back to that slide a couple, you know, two slides ago, that's a lot of stuff to keep track of. 
Um, second, so given that we're looking at a map image and we see something interesting, we needed a way to get at the data for the individual patterns in a user-friendly and intuitive way. We needed a way to facilitate these side-by-side -side comparisons of map images. And we also needed a way to explore more complex relationships with the, uh, uh, between the different uh, types of annotations that maybe aren't apparent from looking at any single map or even looking at maps side-by-side. -side. Um, so in order to answer these challenges, I developed the Human Mouse uh, Sys Regulatory Module Browser, or CRMB. And I apologize for the quality of this image, but um, this does have several features that are designed to answer those specific challenges. So for instance, in terms of data organization, uh, there are persistent navigational menus and tabbed browsing. Um, there's interactive SOM map images that allow us access to those module level and uh, more detailed pattern level uh, statistics. And there are advanced data exploration fe features such as the compare maps utility and the extensible search function that help us look at these more complex questions, along with integrated help, direct links to external resources uh, so we can dig deeper if we so desire, and uh, the ability to bookmark and copy paste URLs to uh, share and save exact uh, data views. Uh, so that is available at this address. It is publicly available. I invite all of you to uh, go and try that out at uh, your leisure. And if you find any bugs or have any suggestions, send those to my email address. Um, and before I go on to talk more about the functions of the browser itself, I want to tell you a bit about the technology that I built it from. So the browser exists on two linked Docker containers. So there's a server container that hosts an Nginx web server for the front end requests. And there's a Catalyst MCV framework that handles the back end requests and the rendering of the actual HTML views that are served to the user's browser. And that sits on top of a MySQL database container that houses the actual data and annotations. So the user interface is based on JavaScript and AJAX with CSS-based navigation menus. And the primary code base is jQuery with some site-specific hacks related to the uh, URL persistence and such. Um, and the actual SOM map images are stored in an SVG vector format that allows them to be fully integrated into the UI um, and completely interactive. So this was a fairly low-level, ground-up approach, which I took because it gave us the flexibility and uh, 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 power to implement exactly what we wanted in a uh, user interface. But it did require some substantial upfront development time. So those of you who may be considering some you know, similar type of uh, utility for your project will want, will want to keep that in mind. And if something that's more of an out-of-the-box solution, like Shiny, for instance, might meet your needs, you could potentially save a lot of time by using that instead of starting from the ground up, as we did. But if you do decide that this is the way to go, I will mention that there are a lot of online tutorials and uh, online help you, um, resources for all of these tools, which really did make it uh, fairly um, easy for me to get started and build this tool. And that we will also, once this uh, work is published, hopefully very soon, be making this browser available as a public GitHub repository. And um, anybody then is welcome to take it. It will be publicly licensed, so you can take it and spin up your own browser mirror or use it to do whatever you want. So um, there, it, it's, it's not, you know, there, there, are, there are resources available. <clears throat> All right, moving along. So when you go to this address, the first thing you're going to see is the CRMB homepage. And that just has a few simple components here. There's a rotating SOM map image, a set of navigational menus, and a simple introductory paragraph. And from here, you can get to any of the three sections that I mentioned, the module browser, the compare maps utility, or the extensible search. So the first one of these is the module browser. And as you might guess, this is the optimal way to explore module level annotations. And it has five main components. So there's the set of navigational men menus I mentioned before. There's an in integrated help links an interactive SOM map image, a pattern summary table, and a set of detailed annotation tabs. And while the content of these tabs varies and is tailored to the specific type of content that's uh, 
um, that's shown on that tab. Uh, in general, oh, oh, sorry, wrong button there. In general, uh, you'll find a set of configuration menus and then a set of tables that are sortable and that show pattern level um, or module level data. So rather than talk more about these, I'd like to switch over here into an actual browser and give you a demonstration. All right, so um, let's zoom out a little bit so you can see things a little better. So here we are on the uh, browser homepage. Zoom in a bit more. And here's this uh, rotating map image that I mentioned. So this refreshes, I think, every five seconds or something. And one thing I didn't mention about this is that this is a fully inter interactive image. So if you hover over any spot on this map, it'll tell you what pattern number is, it is that you're looking at. And uh, one thing that I do often, um, if I'm not sure what I'm looking for, or I just want to look for interesting stuff that maybe I haven't noticed before, you can watch these rotate. And when you, whenever you see something that interests you, go ahead and click on that map, and it will take you right into the browser with uh, data for the uh, map and uh, pattern that you clicked on. Great. So if you do know what you want, though, ahead of time. When you're looking at those, how yes. do you know that something might be interesting? <laughs> it just looks like a bunch of hexagons in different colors to me. Uh, well, it may not be very interesting to you, but I mean, if you see something that's <laughs> <laughs> maybe you won't see something interesting. All right, so maybe you're looking at this one, for instance. You're like, okay, well, here's a group of red hexagons amid some blue ones. You know, what does that mean? You can click on that and go in and find out more. I'll talk a little bit more about the the uh, features of the browser here and how you can get more information about the maps themselves and so forth. Um, is there anything about what the relatedness is of adjacent things? Or? So, yeah, so the self-organizing map uh, arranges these hexagons based on the, um, a, it's a distance measure between the uh, vector, uh, the vector that it uses to kind of summarize the data, this, the transcription factor binding data that's associated with that pattern. Um, so, Hexagons that are closer together are, um, in theory, more similar in their transcription factor content and potentially then more similar in function. Uh, we haven't really done a whole lot in terms of follow-up on whether, on whether like more patterns that are closer together on the map are serving more similar functions and things that are further away. But um, so it, generally, that's what that you know, kind of topography means. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Like, what's happening when there's, you've got two things that have very different colors, but they're right next door to each other. Well, that depends on, that depends on which map you're looking at in a specific annotation. So let me talk more about um, what these, about the functionality here and how you could actually follow up on that question. So let's say you did know what you were looking for here, and you were interested in, say, transcription factors, and you wanted to look at a map that showed how CTCF fits into all of this. Um, so you can click on uh, CTCF on that transcription factor menu. And that first takes you to this placeholder page where it just shows the map. Um, so if you want to know more about this map at this point, you can click about this map. It'll bring up a dialog here that tells you exactly what the map shows. This one doesn't say very much, but this shows the fraction of all peaks uh, within each pattern. Uh, so I use peak and module a little interchangeably at this point. Uh, but uh, when I say peak, just think module for now. Uh, so within each pattern, the fraction of all peaks that uh, have evidence for CTCF binding, right? So if I switch to a different pattern, so let's see, one of the ones that would have been, all right, so here's one of the ones that has the different colors. So this tells you what the uh, Plot is showing, and if you look at the key here, so red is here indicating uh, the uh, uh, that that uh, a particular target gene is expressed at a high level in uh, MEL cells and mouse MEL cells, whereas blue indicates high expression in mouse CH12 cells. So it's just like it's a heat map kind of uh, an arrangement where that uh, color gradation. Uh, indicates the expression level uh, between those two cell lines, cell lines, right? Okay, so you can find that type of information by using this about this map link on any of the uh, browser pages. All right. Anyway, so getting back to 
demo here. So let's say we were interested in that pattern. So we can click on that pattern and be taken into the main browser here. In theory. Depending on the number of modules uh, that are in the uh, that are in the pattern, um, it, it will take sometimes a fair bit of time for these to load, and that's actually something I'm working on um, as a future direction to uh, do some kind of incremental loading to speed this up. But anyway, so once we click on that, you'll notice that the pattern that we selected is highlighted here in green, so we can keep track of where where on the map that is as we browse around. And over here on the right you'll see there's a uh, summary table that shows pattern level data. And this tells the uh, core set of transcription factors that make up that pattern, how many factors there are in that core set, the number of modules that contribute to the pattern, how many came from human, how many came from mouse, and so forth. Um, and the uh, last one I'd like to point out here specifically is the set of cells that are um, in which that particular grammatical pattern is used. Um, and if you want to know more about these codes, there is that it, that does exist in the um, help sections. So, um, <clears throat> if we've if we've taken a look at this and we want to then change out to a different map, we can do that simply by going through the menus. It swaps out the map, but it leaves all the other content intact with the same pattern selected on the map. And this does update the uh, location in the uh, in the um, address bar in your browser so you can use your back button to navigate uh, back to the view you were looking at before. You can copy paste that, you can bookmark it, you can send that to a, a colleague or collaborator, um, so whatever you want so it's easy to reproduce and share these data. Um, so I mentioned about the, let's see, I mentioned the about this map link and how you can kind of use that as a tool to learn about the different maps. Um, but let's say uh, we want to dig deeper into the uh, question I brought up before. So we were looking at this plot of median transcription start site distances and I noted here there's a pattern that's close to transcript that contains uh, cis regulatory modules that are close to transcription start sites and we wanted to know more about the histone modifications that those modules carry. So we'll click on that pattern and it'll load up all the data and if we go down here to the tabbed browsing section, you'll see there's nine different tabs, and two of these are related to histone modifications. So there's a histone modification tab and a Chrome HMM tab. So for any of these uh, tabs, there is a information button here that you can click and find out more about the content of that tab, including what the different tables do and show. Um, and each of these tabs has a slightly different set of information and a slightly different setup that's tailored to showing the specific type of data that are mapped onto that tab. All right, so we were interested in histone modifications, so we'll take a look at that tab. And you see that there's a set of histograms, and within each of these histograms, uh, this, is, this is illustrating, it's, it's just a, uh, um, it's a, it's a set of bins um, from um, the lowest to highest maximum scores for these different uh, chip seek uh, scores for these different uh, modifications that were seen within the modules. So the number of modules that have a maximum score within each bin is shown on here. So the far further to the right the bar is, the uh, more prevalent that modification is in a particular cell type, right? So we see just at a glance here that H3K9 acetylation, K79 dimethylation, and K4 trimethylation are pretty prevalent in, these, in, this, in this set. If we want to get more detailed, we can scroll down a little further, and we have some tables that show actual pattern and, mod and uh, module level uh, averages and then individual observations here. So the first table is pattern-wise averages. And I'll, I, I, I will point out here that there are some color codes associated with each cell in the table. So the color uh, of, the, uh, of the cell indicates the species of origin. And I actually caught a bug here in this day, or in, in, in this. Uh, but uh, purple is uh, our shared measurements that are related to both species. Red are mouse measurements. So this cell here actually should be red, but isn't. Um, and blue are human measurements. 
Um, and the density of the shading in the cell relates to the range of values that we've observed. So the darkest cell is going to represent the maximum value, and the lightest cell is the minimum value. So this gives us a way at a glance to evaluate which things are more prominent in the data set. So if we look at this, in the averages uh, table, you're seeing it looks as if there is a trend toward higher H3K4 trimethylation scores. If we want to get a little more detailed, we can go down here to the CRM level table. And you'll see that these are sorted by default by cell and location. But these are, these are custom sortable, so you can click on the header for any column and sort that either in an ascending or descending manner. If you want to do multiple columns, you can hold down shift and click on columns sequentially. So let's go ahead and just sort here by H3K4 trimethylation. And if we scroll down here, we can see that that definitely stands out among all the other columns. So as we would expect, um, H3K4 trimethylation, uh, which is a um, histone modification associated with active promoters, it does appear to be the most prominent modification we're seeing. All right, so that gives you an example of one way in which we can follow up on these uh, things that we see out at, the, out at the pattern level if we want to get into uh, further detail. Oh, also I should mention here that these locations are clickable, and if you click on the location for any one of these modules, it'll take you directly into the uh, UCSC genome browser where you can add even more annotations and see what else lives in that particular piece of DNA to uh, follow up um, you know, to any, any level of detail you'd like to. All right, are there any questions on the browser before I move along? Yeah. Uh, I see that when you <coughs> paste your HTTP link, open another browser. Can you speak you, louder, please? I'm sorry. When you copy the HTTP link, you copy to another browser. So underlying that, are you creating a different directory in your web, web server, or is it just that your web server will interpret the HTTP file? So all of those parameters are stored in the, in the query string at the end of the base URL. So everything kind of after the question mark in here. So oh, you can't really see that. But all right, so all these, all these little terms here, so it's a, it's a key value. Um, scheme right here, and it, all these all these values here in the query string after this question mark tell the server exactly what to produce and then serve as an end view. Uh, at this at this point, everything that you do in the browser except for sorting tables is stored in that query string, so you can reproduce that exact view. So, so the uh, arguments after yeah. the Argument. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And uh, so when uh, your collaborator opens the link, the web server will regenerate the whole image again. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, nothing is being stored on the server side or uh, really on the client side, except, you know, as far as your browser history. Um, you know, there's no cookies or anything like that that are being generated here. It's all done through the URL. So I you know, found that to be the most um, uh, flexible way of approaching this. And about your sort table, how, how do you? The table sorting? Yeah. So that's done through, there's a, it's a jQuery add-on um, that, uh, that handles all of that. And the only reason that's not stored in that uh, search, uh, in that, in that uh, query string right now is because I haven't figured out how to um, hack that in order to um, have that level of persistence. So that's one of the things on my to-do list, though, because it would be, I think, very helpful to be able to have a table sorted exactly the way you left it, you know, when you send that. So you don't have to, you know, send it to somebody and then say, and then click on this header and the thing. And But um, that's a work in progress. And yes, that's my, uh, another CGI argument with sort equals to whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just it it comes on the um, on the side of actually how to then um, take that take that argument and render it um, into a kind of default sort order, right? So there's a way of de of specifying default sort orderings on all these different tables, 
but it's a little more difficult to uh, take that from a CGI argument and I have some ideas on how to do it, but I just haven't gotten to the point of uh, playing around with it yet. So, anything else? Yeah, I have a yeah. quick question just about the colors that you use uh -huh. in the table. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Are Let me scroll like down to that. Standard colors, because I feel like the purple and the blue, from a usability perspective, could be easily um, confused by some people. Potentially. Um, so uh, standard colors in terms of like <laughs> following some standard, uh, no, no. So there, I mean, the red is just pure red. The blue is just pure blue. The purple is I don't know what exactly. Um, I guess my suggestion would just be you may want to consider okay. using a different color than the purple. Something yeah. that might be a little more obvious. It may, yeah, it, or yeah, I could look at that because um, it does kind of, especially on certain displays, kind of wash out contrast-wise. Right, right. I mean, that's an issue I have with a lot of these maps too. So, like for instance, I'll show you one map here that was particularly troubling. Um, is this uh, map where it's different color codes? So this actually, I did end up using a. Um, Oh, what's the, there's a set of palettes that you can use that are supposed to be like colorblind friendly and such. So this is using those colors and hopefully displays to like most people. Hopefully most people can see all the 15 different shades here. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. But, <laughs> but yes, that's a good point. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and pop back over into the presentation here and keep moving. Um, so in the interest of time, let's move on here to the next uh, map section. If, any, if there's any other questions on the browser, feel free to ask me at the end. Um, so the next function I'd like to tell you about is the uh, compare maps utility. And so this gives you the ability to do these side-by-side uh, -side map comparisons that I alluded to before. And the components of that are, again, navigation menus and integrated help. And then there's a set of interchangeable SOM map images, which you can add and remove and swap out at will. And each of these is associated with an independent pattern summary table that has a direct link to uh, the browser data as well. So let's go ahead and do a quick demo of that as well to show what that's capable of. All right, so the first thing you're going to see when you go to the... Uh, Compare Maps page is, the, is this default screen. And this has a help link. If you click on that, it gives you a quick view of how to use this tool. And there's a link to a more detailed uh, description down in the full help section. Uh, but basically what you see here is a, is, a, is a menu. So you choose a category, and you'll note that the same options are available here as you see over in the main navigational menus. So once you've selected one, so let's go ahead and select Maps here. Once you've selected that, then the map menu will be populated with all the uh, maps that are available for that particular uh, category. So let's go back to our median TSS distance plot that we were looking for before. So recall that we looked at the histone modifications, and we saw that there were modifications for that pattern that were consistent with um, active enhancers, or excuse me, um, active promoters. So let's say we want to know if that's generally true for patterns that are near TSSs. So we can add another map here, and we're given the same menu. And let's check histone modifications here. And let's take a look at H3K4 trimethylation as the uh, map type. All right, so that comes up. And the, d the deeper shading is uh, corresponding to a higher maximum score for that particular modification. And as you can see, there is a fairly good correlation between the distance to the transcription start site and that uh, increasing score for H3K4 trimethylation, trimethylation. So at any time as we're looking at these, if we want to get more information on a given pattern, we can click on a location on the map. And we'll, take, we'll get that same pattern summary table that we saw before. And the ability to jump over to the browser in a new window that shows you the detailed data associated with that map and pattern. And these are independent, so you can click on different ones for different maps. And it does not change the content for the uh, maps you've already got selected. And then at any time, if you want to swap out these maps, so let's say, OK, we've looked at trimethylation. Let's look at acetylation, at uh, K9 acetylation. We can swap that map out. 
All the other data remains intact, but it changes the map, and we can see, okay, with K9 acetylation, we also see good correlation. Let's go ahead and add a third map here, and we'll just pick a random one. So we can do this as many times as we want and add as many maps as we want. And then let's say we decide we're done with the second map. Just by clicking remove, we can get, that, get rid of that and then compare these two maps side by side. So this was actually a fairly uh, uh, simple, simply, seem, seemingly simple tool, um, but it actually had some fairly uh, uh, nagging challenges technologically to get it to work, most, uh, most, mostly related to namespacing between all of these different SVG images. Um, so while this, while this tool is uh, fairly simple and I hope fairly intuitive, um, there's actually a fair bit of technology going on underneath the hood. So if any of you want to know any more about that, feel free to ask me at the end and I'd be happy to walk you through what I did with that. But anyway, um, are there any questions on that? Yes? I'm not really understanding like um, kind of the science behind this. I'm thinking like as a user, if I'm looking at, at the map at the top, I see a mm -hmm. cell, I'm like, that one's really interesting. I would think I would want to be able to compare that exact same cell in the, the other map, but it's kind of hard to figure out where that cell is. Yeah. It would be nice to have some way of saying, I highlight really that in, in the other map that I have too, so that I don't have to count and count and try and find right. it. Well. So one thing that helps with that is if you hover over locations on the map, it does come up with a tool tip that tells you. So you can use that to guide you. I do understand what you're saying, though. And yes, that is, that is, that is, that is kind of, yeah, you know, you still have to kind of hunt for it. Um, so yeah, and that is a, that's a great suggestion. I hadn't, I, I hadn't really thought about that so much. But yes, so it would be a fairly simple thing to do to like have a checkbox that, you know, some set of configuration options and like have a checkbox where you say like link all tables or, or link, link, link all maps so it does do that. Yeah, that would be a, that would be a great uh, um, extension to this. Yeah, thank you for that suggestion. Anything else? Nope, okay. Let's switch back over here to the uh, presentation then and I'll talk to you about the uh, last function I'll, I'll show you today which is the extensible search. So this has two components. There's a query input form and a results display. Um, so the query input form allows you to construct arbitrarily complex queries directly against the browser database. So you're basically putting together an SQL query without having to know any SQL and what joins to perform and, you know, how, and, and so forth. So just by selecting things on, on uh, menus and maps or menus and text entry fields, you can put together a query that will go out and find the exact data that you want to look for these more complex associations. So it again has the navigation menus and, and uh, integrated help we're used to seeing. It has a structured search entry form and uh, the ability to add multiple order and grouping conditions. So once we formatted our query here and hit search, it's going to serve that up to the browser. Um, the database is going to run the search for us and uh, then the server will send us back a results display. And this visually projects the results onto the SOM map and gives us detailed uh, data on the pattern and uh, module level. So this has the navigation menus again. There's a table that gives us the query parameters exactly as we supplied them and how we, how we uh, instructed to uh, uh, combine those terms. An interactive map that shows the results count per grammatical pattern. And then if we click on any of those cells, we can get this same pattern summary table with link out to the browser. And then down at the bottom, there's a sortable table of results. So let's go through and uh, run, go back to the browser here and we'll run some queries to show you how this works. All right, so we start here off on the search entry form. And again, we have a help link that will take us to a uh, summarized a set of instructions on how to use that tool with a direct with a link to more detailed help information. And the first decision we have to make is whether we're going to search for individual CIS regulatory modules that meet our search criteria or entire grammatical patterns that meet, meet those criteria. So we'll do one of each of those today, but the first one I want to do is a module level search. 
So if you think back to um, earlier in the talk, I showed you how you can select individual maps from these menus, and that one of the options is to choose a map that shows the uh, uh, density of individual transcription factors within those uh, grammatical patterns. But this only shows us one factor at a time. So what if we want to look at multiple factors? We can do that. So if we select transcription factors as our table here, so that will uh, populate the field uh, menu, which just basically tells us what columns in the database are available to search against. So we'll choose name. And let's go with CTCF as our search term here. We'll add another transcription factors, name. Let's say we want to look at the cohesin complex. So let's add SMC3 as our second term. That's another member of the cohesin complex. And then let's say we want to, say, look at um, MIC in association with um, the cohesin complex. So again, we'll choose transcription factor, name, and we'll put MIC in here. We can go one further. We can add another one. It'll become clear why I'm adding so many here in a minute. Let's say we also want to look at EP300. So you'll notice that as I added all these rows, it gave us an option here on how we want to combine these terms. So AND is the default. So as this is set up right now, it's going to look for modules that meet all four of these criteria. So we can change any of these to any of the available um, SQL combination options here. So let's say we want to not just look at MIC and EP3, but MIC or EP3 that are associating with uh, Cohesin. So we switch that to OR, but this doesn't quite do it for us yet, because what this is telling it is to look for all three of these terms together and EP300 and EP as a separate term. So CTCF, SMC3, and MIC, or EP300, which is not really what we want. So what we need to do is combine these two terms into a parenthetical group. So it will look for CTCF and SMC3 and MIC or EP300. And we can do that by clicking this group with next bo or box here, which sets a, in essence sets a set of parentheses around these two terms. So once we've done that, we can go ahead and click search. And depending on how many rows are in the set result set, this can take a minute or two. So I've already preloaded the results for this on a separate tab. So let's just pop right over to that tab. And this is what you'll see from this particular search. So here's all your query parameters and how they were combined. And here's the map that I uh, mentioned that shows how these uh, results, uh, excuse me, the number of results that mapped each individual pattern. And you can hover over these to get tool tips. It'll tell you the pattern number and the number of results. And just to show you here, <coughs> another way of looking at this would have been to use this compare tools uh, or compare maps utility that we played with before and look at all four of these individual maps side by side. So we can do that. And by doing that, we can see, you know, yes, there are overlaps here. And you could probably, you know, especially if I add the functionality to like link the uh, uh, selections together, you know, you can see which, which individual patterns do overlap. But it's much easier to see that given this uh, view in the search result. So uh, uh, you can click on any of these. So this is the one with the most density. Let's click on that and see what it is. That's pattern 951. It tells you what it is. It gives you the ability to jump to the browser. And then if you want more detail, you can uh, come down here into the uh, table. You can again sort this, for instance, by pattern ID. And you can go through and see all the modules that fall within you know, that any given pattern, um, any given cell type, whatever you want. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, are you linking this module to genes? So um, when we do the, for certain types of the annotations, yes. So when we're looking at gene expression and like the gene set enrichment, uh, which I didn't mention, but that's one of the, uh, the Go, the Go um, enrichments tab. So those, those we do link to a uh, target gene. And we just do that simply based on the nearest TSS. Um, actually, we're using chip enrich to do that. And so uh, we're using the uh, target gene calls from chip enrich um, for the remainder of our analyses. So um, yes, good question. Um, all right, so let's go back and 
Um, that's actually a good segue into this next search that I want to demonstrate for you guys. So let's say we're a researcher that's interested in a particular pathway. And so for an example, I'm going to say the Jack Stat pathway. And we want to see if we can find modules that target both of the core gene families in that, Jack and Stat, right? So we're going to use a pattern level query here. So we select patterns as the base table. And under here for table, one of the options is target genes. So we'll pick target genes. And we have several columns to choose from, and target gene is one of them. That gets us to the target gene name. And we can put Jack. We know there are multiple genes in the Jack family, though, and we want to look for any gene in the Jack family, not just like Jack 1 or Jack 2. So we'll set our comparison as like rather than equal to. We also have other options there. There's greater than, not equal to, greater than or equal to which, you know, for some things do make sense and other things don't make sense, but this is the one that makes sense for us, so we're going to do that. So we'll add another term. We'll pick another target gene here. Target genes, target gene. And again, we don't want a specific stat family member. We want just stat family members in general, so we'll do that with like. And we can go ahead and click search. And this is actually a very fast query because it has a small number of rows that it returns. And we see that we do indeed have some patterns that include modules that target both Jack and Stat. Not individual modules that target both genes, obviously, but there's a module, at least one module that targets Jack, at least one module that targets a Stat family gene. And we can click on those to find out more about what they are. Go to the browser if we want to, um, and so forth. Um, and we can see, it's like, okay, what transcription factors appear to be involved? And one of the things that I noticed as I was working through this example is actually quite convenient is that two of these patterns, these two patterns here, oops, not that one, these two patterns here actually include EP300, which uh, when I dug into it a little, a little bit, uh, I, I did find that P300 is indeed uh, involved in regulating the Jack stat pathway, so that was convenient. This actually is a good example that uh, you know this, 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 this might actually work. So I always like finding things like that. Um, but anyway, that's uh, basically what I wanted to show you as far as the search functionality. So if there are any questions on that before I pop back into the presentation. This is one of the areas that's very actively under development because there's a lot more that I would like to do with this search. I'll talk about that more in a bit. But uh, anyway, so <clears throat> this is, I think, the most powerful uh, feature of the browser. So putting putting substantial investment of time into getting that better and more um, um, extensible. All right, anyway, so in summary, I've shown you today how gene expression can be compared to a language where transcription factors are analogous to words that can be combined into more complex regulatory sentences by following a regulatory grammar. So given that a lot of these regulatory sentences have equivalent meanings, we can combine them with machine learning methods into grammatical patterns that we can then follow up on and probe their functional uh, properties. Uh, but this poses several challenges, primarily related to data organization and interpretation. And so to answer these challenges, I've developed the Human Mouse Sys Regulatory Module Browser to help interpret these data. And so this has a lot of possible applications. And the only one of these that I've listed here that I want to specifically call out for today is that we believe that this data has a lot of potential in terms of identifying shared and species-specific regulatory logic, which may serve to guide translational research. So there's obviously a lot of other different things that you can do. And you can you know, keep adding to this list in your mind. Um, but I want to move on here to future directions, because I'm running out of time quickly. Um, so I do want to develop this uh, browser. Uh, I, I do want to develop this browser to be a much more uh, kind of nimble and uh, flexible tool. Um, the first, the, one of the short list things that I want to do is to be able to build these images directly from data in the database to uh, greatly decrease my time input in tailoring all those images uh, specifically, but also to allow user customization and the ability for the user to say, okay, I want to plot with this data you know, uh, in order to show exactly, you know, what you want to see. Um, I want to make many improvements to the search function, including refinements to the search form that will make it hopefully more user-friendly and intuitive. Because um, even, you know, right now you don't have to know any SQL, but it's fairly busy and 
um, you know, there could be a there could be a learning curve involved in using that, which I hope to hope hopefully it won't be so bad, and the help functions should help with that. Uh, but I also would like to add other ways to search, such as by gene networks or biological pathways or so forth, and particularly to be able to specify what columns you're seeing in the output. So right now it's basically just dumping everything from the database to the user display, and it's a lot of stuff. So most of which most people aren't going to be interested in. So that's also a short list thing to give away to configure the output. And possibly even give other visualization op options, such as what exactly to project onto the uh, map grid. You know, right now it's the count of results, but maybe you want to see like something related to gene expression or, um, you know, what have you. And possibly other types of views that can show how the data relate to each other and such, like a network or a schematic type view. Um, and also to improve the speed, um, there's things I can do on the back end. Um, continued refinements to the UI, like giving more visualization and customization options. And it may make sense to incorporate more client-side functionality in doing all of this um, to give an added level of uh, flexibility. So um, anyway, um, if you can come up with any others, I know this is, this is uh, quite a list here, but I can't think of everything. And you know, I've gotten one great suggestion today already. So uh, if you guys go out and try this out, if you come up with any great ideas for things to incorporate, please send those to me, and I will definitely, uh, you know, see if that fits into our plan. All right, with that, I want to acknowledge the members of the Boyle Lab for all their support and help in uh, developing this, and uh, acknowledge our funding sources, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, NHGRI, and NSF, and uh, thank you all for coming today. And uh, with that, I'll uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and you kind of hinted at one. Like, I can think of two really uh, powerful uses for this. One is uh, like you define gene lists from uh, other differential expression experiments uh -huh. or, or human data, so that you can get hint sets at to the regulatory. But you've got genes that are modulated somehow, and then you get a sense of what's actually regulating. So then you kind of hinted on that. Another would be uh, incorporating uh, large-scale SNP data and seeing uh -huh. if SNPs actually hit any of these regulatory frameworks because then that will give the insight into how some of the might be. Uh -huh. So we, we do actually have. Um, we've done we've, we've touched on that a little bit. So we do have GWAS data in here. <laughs> For human only, because we don't have the data for mouse, but we do have some GWAS uh, in here, and this particular pattern doesn't show any enrichments. But uh, let's click one over here that does. Um, right, so you can see this shows uh, some things here about, it's very hard to see this, and I apologize, but um, this tells some things about the GWAS categories. Um, the actual GWAS ontology terms and such. Um, there's definitely much more that we could do with this, um, but and I haven't figured out a great way other than just showing like the density of the GWAS results on here to show like deeper, you know, on the, at, at least in terms of the SOM plot, kind of digging deeper into that. But uh, yeah, that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, suggestion. Particularly, I do like the idea of, of uh, the lists of genes. Because um, right now, like it, like, you know, with my Jack Stat example, even with two genes, it's fairly, it's a little bit cumbersome to enter in just even two genes. Um, and on the back end, actually, once you get beyond a certain point, the, so the more genes you add, the slower the query becomes, because right. um, it's more joins that it has to perform and such. Um, so yeah, so I've got some um, some kind of engineering work to make something like that possible. But that's a, that's a great suggestion. Anything else? I wasn't really a superintendent. That feature is sometimes called link rushing, and auto complete on those values would be super greedy. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think I thought the same yeah. thing. Um, so when you were doing your queries, um, you started to type something. Yeah. It was really awesome to have like an auto complete there. Oh, that says, okay. Hey, mm -hmm. here are the values that I have in my database. So here okay. are some, yep. some ideas. Um, another thing that I, a comment that I had on the searching is make sure that you're protecting against SQL injection. Yes. Um, so we are doing that right now on a fairly rudimentary level. Um, 
But yes, <laughs> we are concerned about that. Yeah. So yeah. Just on the, the original map visualizations, mm -hmm. the scales that you show on the left. Yes. One, it, it seems a little skinny. I'm not sure if it's just my angle, but sometimes it's hard to actually <laughs> yeah. see the yeah. colors yeah. outside you're, the corner. You're absolutely, yep, you're absolutely right. Um, also, it just, I look at that and I think it's a y-axis, and it's not. Okay, and, okay. And I'm, I'm, I, that might be too complicated, but moving it just kind of. Just, just kind of, away, okay, so yeah. Yeah. So part of that is so uh, you know it's it's it wasn't probably let's see let me show you a different one here so some of these have like multiple uh, measures mapped to the same cell right so I actually so I did do some uh, um, I, some of these plots I actually added to the base functionality in this R package the ones I did I actually worked in wider uh, wider keys. Um, and one thing that I did do in doing that is give the ability to like supply that key width as an argument to the plotting function. Uh, but I never actually got to go back and like fix all the ones that were already uh, completed. So that's that's the ex explanation for that. I know it's kind of an excuse. It's a uh, wishy-washy sort of a. <laughs> I just didn't have the you know the time to do all that over again after. It's like. Um, so the process in doing these actually, and this is why I really want to move to having these built on the fly, because you know then I could then I then I could have an option. It's like have the user say, "How wide do you want that to be? Where on the plot do you want it to be?" Things like that. Uh, but from start to finish, doing all the plots that are in here takes me about three days in terms of producing and tweaking and resizing, so they all look the same in the browser view. And <laughs> so it's uh, it is you know once you've done it, you don't want to have to do it again. So, all right, if that's all, thank you guys very thank much. You.